Good day, everyone. My name is David Williams, Executive Director of the United States Association for Energy Economics. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Energy Transition and Corporate Strategy from Adaptation to Transformation. We are grateful to our presenter, TJ Conway from Intelli Energy Intelligence for today's timely discussion. We are also grateful to the National Capital Area Chapter USAEE for co-hosting this webinar with USAEE. First, a little bit about the United States Association for Energy Economics. We are the largest affiliate of the International Association for Energy Economics and provide a forum for the exchange of ideas, experience, and issues among professionals interested in the field. The organization produces two professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations along with a host of other products and services that you can find on our website at www.usae.org. If you're not already a member of the association, we welcome you to join. A few housekeeping matters in regard to today's webinar before I hand things over to our speaker. First, this webinar is being recorded for those that cannot participate in today's live event. If you have questions for our speaker, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window and type your question. We've allocated sufficient time at the end of the presentation to address your questions. And now I would like to introduce you to our speaker, TJ Connor, Director in the Research and Advisory Group at Energy Intelligence, as well as Head of Energy Transition Research. TJ, over to you. Thank you so much. David, I am uh, Dave. I am just uh, sharing my screen right now. Uh, I hope uh, everyone can see it. Um, and uh, without further ado, I will. Uh, I'll begin. Allow me one second to make sure that I can um, can view the the questions as they come in. So apologies for one second. Um, it and, seems as and TJ, you'll want to share your screen when you uh, have yes. a chance. Okay. Let me. Oh, I see. That's that is the issue now. I click share. So now I think it should be visible. Um, there you go. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you everyone for, for attending today. Uh, I uh, thank you, Dave and USAE and Rebecca and, and, and also uh, the uh, NCAC uh, chapter as well. I appreciate everyone's uh, attendance and interest today. Um, so uh, I, I just to, very briefly, my goal of this presentation is to share some of the recent work that we've been doing uh, at Energy Intelligence on, on the energy transition. Um, first, I'll, I'll give you a, a bit of background on, on how we're approaching our uh, energy transition analysis. Uh, and then I will present some of the results of our recent uh, corporate, uh, corporate analysis and benchmarking work. Um, finally, I will outline and, and discuss some of the recent strategy developments uh, that we've seen uh, in, in the last uh, six months or so, led by uh, European majors, uh, largely. So, uh, so without further ado, uh, I, will, I will jump into the presentation. Um, so just to give you a sense of, of where I'm coming from in, in, in this presentation, I wanted to step back and, and discuss sort of what, we're, what, I, what I seek to cover in, in, in the work that we do uh, at, at, at Energy Intelligence. So uh, we uh, it just in the last two months have launched uh, the Energy Transition Service, uh, which is a guide to the helping cli uh, clients, uh, you know, guide, guide them through the energy transition. Uh, and uh, I, the, the, what, what I would emphasize is that we've done a lot of work on, the, on energy transition issues for, for many years now. Uh, in fact, really almost an entire decade, but, uh, but we've, we've uh, used this, uh, this last uh, six months or so as an opportunity to, to better integrate our work and build upon that work. Um, I have previously been doing a lot of work on macro issues, but, but energy transition questions always uh, emerged, whether it was about peak oil demand and, and, the, and electrification of the vehicle fleet or, or rising uh, environmental, social, and governance pressures. And so this, is, this was our uh, uh, opportunity to, to integrate a lot of the work that we've done across uh, our company uh, from the reporting that we do on the energy intelligence, uh, the editorial side, uh, through to the research and advisory group that I'm part of. Uh, we have a good uh, set of data 
and uh, and the independent analysis that that, that we lead in, in the research and advisory team. Uh, so with that with that as background, this this energy transition service uh, covers uh, a range of different thematic areas, as you can see on the the soccer ball graphic to your right, uh, and uh, you know that includes the the big market market moving issues, technologies, policy trends, uh, and and sort of broad macro questions like we're seeing with sort of the rise of coronavirus and the implications for the energy transition. For this specific uh, presentation, I'll focus primarily on corporate positioning and strategy. So the que three key questions that we're seeking to answer in this service are, what is the, just understanding the nature of the transition and how it's unfolding, to the impact that it has on the oil and gas industry in particular, uh, and then three, the implications for companies and co countries. Uh, it, 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 especially resource, uh, major resource holding uh, producing uh, states. So that's, that gives you a little bit of a background on where I'm coming from. Uh, I'd like to go into a little bit more depth uh, so that you can understand where, what, how, we're, how we approach uh, the, our corporate comparative analysis, which is the, the focus of, of this, this presentation, obviously. Um, so the corporate comparative analysis uh, is is made is 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 really centered on, around three sets of benchmarks that we provide, uh, and uh, the the we we've seen that there's a, a need for these these different uh, these different benchmarks and this type of analysis uh, in in the work that we've done in talking with clients and and you know really getting in assess, assessing sort of the 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 uh, the level of interest across the industry. Uh, so the first, uh, the first uh, benchmark you can see there on the left is the ESG climate risk benchmark. What this does is that it ranks companies against what it, it investors are demanding of them, uh, particularly on the climate risk dimension of ESG. I'll point out that, it, that it, environmental, social, and governance uh, indicators, uh, or the, the, the concept and acronym, can be quite broad. It can cover a range of different things. Uh, ESG has meant different things to different people uh, as, as it's become more and more important. What we aim to do is focus specifically on the climate risk dimension of that. Uh, we wed a lot of our work to the emerging standards, uh, for example, the task force on climate related financial disclosure, but we also build upon that in the way that we analyze uh, different aspects of uh, company engagement on ESG, as well as their carbon emissions performance. Uh, on the right-hand side, we, uh, we, we do a lot of work on uh, tracking low-carbon investments uh, in the industry as well. This is really where the, sort of the, the, the rubber meets the road, where companies are uh, you know, not only just making um, statements about uh, their, their you know, low-carbon or transition strategies, but actually uh, putting money where their mouth is. And so we find that this is, the, this is a very important uh, aspect of uh, of understanding how a company's strategies and, and the implementation of those strategies. Uh, we look at low carbon uh, generation uh, across a range of different areas. We're not simply looking at, uh, at renewables uh, power generation. We're looking at sort of the various segments of the, the value chain on the power side, as well as uh, e-mobility and transport, uh, low carbon liquids and gas supplies, as well as negative emissions technologies, including carbon capture uh, and um, you know, other nature-based solutions, uh, and and so that that helps to complement uh, the you know the ESG work, uh, and then the, finally the, the the vulnerability index, which is at the center, uh, is it assesses which companies are best positioned to survive the transition and which are are most vulnerable, and uh, that will be the the actual uh, the main focus of the presentation today. Uh, the results that we have for, that that I can share uh, from from our vulnerability index. So I'll, I'll move move on to the next slide, and uh, and just present to you some of the the overall highlights and and some of the try to answer some of the methodological questions as well as we go through the vulnerability index. So so as I said, the vulnerability index aims to assess which companies are best positioned to survive, to endure the energy transition, and also which are most exposed to transition risks. Uh, how do we do this? We evaluate companies on, uh, on the resilience of their current portfolios, which I'll discuss in a little more detail uh, on the next slide. 
uh, as well as the, their success in devising and carrying out plans to adapt and transform those business models. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's a combination of this, the state of the current, uh, the current portfolio and resilience and where, where companies aim to go in the future and, and, and how they plan to address uh, critical energy transition risks. So below you can see we cover uh, the, this, this, uh, these are 25 companies uh, that we cover. Uh, I, I'd emphasize that we're not covering the top 25 companies, we are covering 25 top companies. Uh, and uh, that, that means that if, if one company or another is excluded, they're, they're, we probably have a reason for it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the company uh, is, is further down sort of the, 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 uh, the list. Uh, in terms of their uh, their performance. This is the main area of, of focus, these companies for now. It provides sort of a, a diverse set of different cases. Uh, and uh, there's also <coughs> questions around availability of data, et cetera, that we also have to keep in mind. Uh, as you can see from this just high level overview of the results, um, there's there are some some important trends that we that I can just mention from the from the very beginning here before we delve into into the individual uh, peer groups more, more deeply. Um, but you can see, for example, that US uh, focused independent EMPs are uh, 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 concentrated uh, on, the, on the left hand side, meaning that they're the most vulnerable. Um, there's, uh, there's also less, uh, less resilient national oil companies that, are, uh, that uh, are, are only slightly more, uh, perform only slightly better on the, vulner on the vulnerability index. Uh, and then on the other on the other side, we have European majors uh, that are really seeking to transform their portfolios. Uh, they're the ones that are leading the index, um, and they are also joined by well-positioned national oil companies, those that have very resilient portfolios. And I will talk about that a little bit more as well. Uh, in the middle, we have uh, European super majors, which which uh, which generally score on par with European uh, European peers on portfolio resilience, but uh, but are, are falling short when it comes to their strategies for adaptation and transformation. So that's, that's kind of a lot to, to throw at you all at once. So let me take a step back and, uh, and look at the, uh, the, uh, the methodology in a little more detail so you can understand how, how we put this together. So our, our aim is to, uh, in, this, in this, uh, this, this index, you know, we're, we're creating a, a, a methodology and a framework, um, you know, basically to help understand this concept of vulnerability. There, it, it's unlike the, the ESG climate risk work that we're doing where the, the methodology and framework kind of exist in one way or another, just given the emerging standards that we've seen from the task force on climate related financial disclosure and SASD and others. Uh, in, in this case, you know, we, we're, we're trying to develop this uh, conceptually and provide the, you know, the underlying factors and, and scoring associated with that. It will inherently be uh, qualitative, but there are important uh, quantitative aspects that we try to employ as well. And we try to take an impartial approach to this. Um, you know, we don't, we, we don't see that there's one single strategy for survival, so to speak. Uh, we, are, we are of the view that companies can take uh, an adaptation approach, uh, which means boosting the resilience of their existing models, business models, or more transformational or transformative approach where they're implementing more radical shifts to their portfolios. We see that there's a broad spectrum of different types of approaches companies can take based on their starting point, based on their visions and, and the shareholder uh, and stakeholder demands. So uh, we, we try to be agnostic on that sense, in that sense. Um, but, uh, but we still are, are, are scoring companies across these two main uh, categories of it, it areas. Uh, so in portfolio resilience, we're really looking at two main issues or, or, or subcategories. Uh, the first is the, the overall snapshot of the current financial resilience of a company. So we're looking at balance street, seat, sheet strength, which is quite important. This is, uh, this is a, a good indication of, of not only a company's um, financial position right now, but also its, its flexibility and ability to, to uh, make adjustments uh, as, uh, as the transition unfolds and you know, perhaps companies will need to make more significant strategic shifts. This gives them that, that uh, the, their financial resilience gives them that, that ability to, to make those types of adjustments. Uh, that could include 
large trans, uh, transactions in, in M&A, for example, in, in order to shift more deeply into one segment or another. Um, uh, second is operational resilience. And so operational resilience looks at you know, the, the cost, the cost of, uh, of, of production, you know, so whether what, what their exposure is to lower cost assets, uh, it, it, we also look at reserves life, uh, and here we we do see that that uh, you know there are stranded asset risks out over the longer term. So companies that have very long, decades long uh, reserves life, they actually do not score as strongly as those that maybe have uh, reserves life in the ten to twenty year range, for example. Uh, that's that's uh, sort of one one factor that actually uh, can have a negative impact, for example, on national oil companies' uh, operational resilience. Um, although national oil companies tend to perform quite well uh, on portfolio resilience overall. Um, and, and, and then we look at uh, the, the carbon, carbon uh, aspects, the emissions aspects of, of, of operational resilience. So we're looking at operational emissions, which are scope one and two emissions. Uh, we're also looking at uh, the, the life cycle emissions as well. Um, and we, you know, develop sort of our own um, uh, proprietary assessment around the life cycle emissions, uh, uh, life cycle portfolio carbon intensity, uh, because this is an area that's still emerging in terms of uh, uh, clearer, uh, more standard, uh, standard uh, reporting uh, compared to to other other aspects. Uh, so that gives you a sense of portfolio resilience. Then there's the adaptation and transformation side. Uh, if portfolio resilience is really giving you a snapshot of the current the current positioning of companies uh, and their ability to to withstand and weather uh, the you know the potential challenges, uh, adaptation and transformation is more forward looking. Uh, it is uh, it is the uh, this this captures uh, companies' uh, stated strategies uh, for uh, for the transition. It includes uh, uh, assessment of their capacity to uh, to uh, execute on strategies. We tie that closely to, uh, to their emissions, uh, the emissions targets questions. Companies have increasingly set uh, emissions reduction uh, targets or ambitions, and we assess the comprehensiveness and ambitiousness of those targets. Uh, and, then, and then we look at uh, various indicators of, of how companies are implementing uh, their, their plans and, uh, and you know, bringing everything uh, really in, in together from, from the long-term targets to the medium-term strategies to the execution itself. So let's delve a little bit more deeply into uh, the, the overall positioning of, of individual companies uh, uh, on this, it, given the work that we've done here. Um, so the first, the first graphic that you saw you know, gives you a, you kind of shows you who was first, who was kind of who's, who's first, who's sort of in the top tier, uh, and so on. Uh, the, this graphic is 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 instructive because we're taking adaptation and transformation and resilience, and we're comparing uh, those uh, adaptation on the y-axis and resilience on the x-axis, and it, it reveals some interesting clusters of companies. Uh, so you can see that still, not surprisingly, the the in, the in, Independent E and P's uh, are, are not faring well on either and either uh, metric uh, and and sort of congregated toward toward the lower left hand side of this. Uh, you can see on the other hand, European majors are generally uh, higher up, especially on adaptation and transformation, and generally perform uh, okay, especially among the super majors uh, on uh, on the resilience scores. In between. We have a couple of different sets of, of, of groups. So you can see national oil companies kind of in, in the mid, mid tier and, and also, but also uh, kind of significant sort of range of, of different uh, scores uh, on, on resilience. So the at risk NOCs are the ones that, you know, for, for one reason or another uh, are, are facing challenges. In some cases it can be financial. Uh, in other cases it can be uh, due to you know, certain aspects of a company's portfolio. What's, what's also Im important and interesting is to see how, generally speaking, there are a lot of resilient NOCs, that, that group, uh, group four. Uh, these companies uh, have uh, lower cost assets in a lot of cases. Uh, they also have, very, they score quite, quite well on, on, on uh, financial indicators. Uh, and 
and actually in, in, in many cases unreported uh, emissions or uh, uh, intensity as well. So that's uh, sort of a, a, an interesting group of, of, of NOCs that we'll uh, talk about uh, in, in more detail later. And then finally, you see the U.S. super majors. They're, they're not, uh, they are relatively uh, in line with, uh, with other super majors, uh, European super majors, for example, uh, on, um, on the resilience side, but, uh, but have, have, have uh, uh, done less uh, to, uh, to uh, lay out their plans for adaptation and transformation. Uh, including setting targets, et cetera, and we'll talk about that further. So, so what I'd like to do now is is just go go through in, in slightly more depth the, these uh, these individual company groups, um, so that you can see a little bit with a little bit more granularity uh, what what uh, what the, uh, the the key uh, trends are and and some of our core um, conclusions. So, so starting out with U.S. independent EMPs. Uh, th this is these, this is a group that was uh, in trouble, uh, you know, facing challenges uh, for sure in many cases, uh, even before the the COVID pandemic, uh, and uh, it, from a, from a purely sort of financial standpoint, balance sheet, etc., uh, in in several cases. Uh, and so the the COVID the COVID crisis has has only magnified some of these challenges. Uh, com these companies, generally speaking, have uh, have a uh, uh, not only have uh, have had uh, you know more limited resilience, but but they've also um, not not necessarily uh, been as responsive as as some other companies in terms of laying out their plans for how to adapt uh, in in the uh, in the in the longer term as well. Uh, and I, there there are some some inherent uh, challenges with this type of business model uh, in in the way that we uh, assess companies. Uh, for example, you know, uh, being very up, being upstream focused, uh, and uh, in some cases, uh, you know, focused on you know, for example, U.S. shale uh, that that uh, sort of uh, limits uh, limits companies' ability to adapt and, for example, um, uh, you know, build out uh, uh, their um, you know or diversify toward uh, other segments of the value chain, uh, et cetera. Uh, so there is a question, I think, about sort of the future. Of the 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 upstream independent uh, EMP business model uh, overall, that I think uh, will will emerge. Uh, the, these companies, I think, you know, are, are also facing a challenge right now, where you know they they, they uh, there's they're facing some of the greatest pressures to act, and at the same time, they uh, you know they, they're they're uh, feeling sort of the some of the greatest pressures uh, uh, just given the crisis, and so that that limits their ability to act. Uh, and you know this. This is obviously uh, predates the uh, the the, uh, the announcement that Chevron is 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 acquiring Noble Energy, um, and and uh, you know I think uh, Noble Energy that that's a you know that that is something that we 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 also acknowledged even earlier that some of these companies uh, are you know potential targets for uh, for for acquisitions uh, during this this period. So that is the U.S. independent EMPs. Um, I, I'll move now to uh, to U.S. super majors, uh, and in this case, um, U.S. super majors. Uh, I, I think you know, we uh, there's you know there's there's one one you know important point is that there's a pretty significant contrast between uh, the the adaptation and transformation scores between U.S. super majors and European super European super majors. Uh, you can see that in the blue in the blue here. Uh, the blue bars that um, you know the, this, the, there's there's this less pressure from investors I think at this point to to respond with with uh, adaptation and transformation strategies uh, perhaps over the past couple of years uh, which is which has been a factor um, and companies too I think uh, the U U.S. super majors are, are are more focused on adaptation of their existing business models and so that has meant that. Uh, you know, it, earlier on, the need to to lay out uh, longer term plans for how they plan to uh, you know radically shift portfolio. Their portfolios may 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 have uh, obviously been sort of less less pressing, and uh, and so there there are still some questions around uh, not just the adaptation and transformation aspect of it, but actually the portfolio resilience as well. So if 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 uh, if U.S. super majors, for example, want to demonstrate 
uh, that, that the, the, the viability of, a, of what you could call a big oil model or an adaptation approach. Uh, critical questions will be around, uh, around being, you know, how, how they can be the, the most resilient companies. And that means both in terms of capital efficiency as well as carbon efficiency. And uh, so this is an, an area where, yes, these companies are, are generally relatively resilient uh, in, in terms of their finances and, and, and operations uh, compared to their European peers. But it, to, to really succeed and thrive, uh, I think there's, there, the, the bar will probably be higher uh, and, and these companies will need to, to demonstrate even, even stronger scores on resilience moving forward. So that is an area where I think you know, we might see more uh, action, more pressure among uh, investors to to uh, to see uh, you know to, for, for, to ask companies to to be more clear in terms of what they what they see what their vision is for their for their for their future uh, in terms of targets uh, as as well as uh, their their medium and longer term strategies. So that that's that's the U.S. super majors, and I'll talk about uh, European majors uh, in in a little bit more depth uh, in contrast. Uh, in, in the latter part of this presentation. Uh, I, I'll, I'll add uh, just uh, some notes here on, on the resilient national oil companies. Uh, so the, res the resilient national oil companies are, 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 are it's, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. I think that this kind of bears out some of the, the, the our, our work bears out some of the, the expectations that, that national oil companies are, um, uh, are less vulnerable in some ways because, uh, because they have access to some of the the, the, the most, uh, the most uh, competitive uh, assets in, in the world in, in, in oil and gas. Um, what's what's uh, also helps these companies in their scores is their, their financial, uh, their financial per, uh, performance as well. Generally, uh, have a, you know relatively profitable, strong gearing, uh, et cetera. You can also see here that that uh, that some of the leading companies are actually more gas weighted. Uh, here, uh, this is this is due to the expectation that that gas demand is likely to to grow um, more rapidly uh, than than oil demand out over the the, the longer term, uh, which which helps as well. Companies that are also uh, more diversified uh, down down the the hydrocarbon value chain, uh, you know, including in petrochemicals, etc., also tend to perform better. Um, so, you know, the, I think the, the, the subtitle, though, is quite important here. We're saying that, you know, that yes, many of these companies have quite advantaged portfolios, but that's not a, um, there's, there's still not very much room for, for complacency. Uh, across, across all 25 companies that we cover, um, we say that all, all of them face energy transition risks and pressures, and, and that includes uh, the, the, even the most resilient national oil companies. Uh, and, and that's for, for various reasons. Uh, it's uh, even though investors, uh, you know, th these companies may be less, less exposed to, to investor pressures. Um, many of them are traded, however. Uh, they also, uh, you know, face, uh, could face potential pressures from, from partners who are concerned about uh, their, their uh, the license to operate, for example, their social license to operate. Uh, there's, there's, Potential pressures uh, from up, from financial markets if companies are issuing debt, uh, and and you know even insurance markets, and then finally you know governments themselves have have set uh, set their their own you know NDCs uh, nationally determined contributions. Uh, there's or commitments. There's there's uh, there's a reason why these uh, these uh, you know these pressures go are, are some, uh, not simply through the investor channel companies, uh, countries are also thinking about this too. And so there are various m m mechanisms or, or means through which uh, com national oil companies will, may face growing pressure moving forward uh, to lay out you know, what, what their plans are for the future and, and how they uh, will, uh, will remain uh, competitive and, and, and uh, you know, uh, thrive. So that's, that's the national oil companies. Uh, and, and then finally, I'd like to kind of uh, Finish the 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 finish out with with European majors uh, on on the vulnerability index. Um, they they you know they are the ones that are advancing more transformational strategies, uh, and uh, this this is uh, again in response to investor pressures that probably predated some of the pressures that we've seen in in other cases like in the United States. Uh, companies are 
uh, have have responded to what what investors are, are, are responding to what investors are, are asking of them. Um, there's there's uh, you know e even though these companies are responding now in in quite significant ways, and which I'll talk about uh, soon. Uh, there's th th it does not mean that that uh, that they're uh, you know in the clear. There's uh, we, we expect that there will be continuing pressure that this is going to uh, this is going to be ongoing and uh, and European majors uh, have will, will have challenges uh, themselves in, in terms of uh, you know really helping really def defining what it is to sort of uh, to undergo pretty significant uh, portfolio shifts uh, and uh, and uh, and how they can balance uh, critical pressures, whether it's or critical tensions, whether it might be uh, the in the near term to, to meet uh, investor uh, invest near term investor uh, uh, demands as well as sort of advance those longer term goals. Uh, and and uh, and in general, just uh, it, it try to uh, to to um, uh, articulate and and um, put in and enact put into place uh, the the types of uh, the type of, of business model that they're pursuing, which is more of a transformational one, one might call a sort of a big energy model, uh, and uh, so those are some of the the, the, the challenges that they will face, and and that that balance and act, uh, especially around uh, fi financial financial performance, uh, is 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 already on display right now. Um, what we see that uh, that that's a that's a key challenge um, uh, that that companies are facing with with some, for example, like Shell cutting its dividend kind of in a historic uh, move these these types of uh, developments are uh, it, it, it indicative of that so that that gives you an overview of of uh, the the general results on the vulnerability index I'm, I'm going to spend the next couple of slides delving a little bit deeper into the European majors uh, strategies because uh, if we look back over the last uh, the last s several months this is where there's been a lot of activity, and it, it gives you a sense of of, of what is what's uh, you know, what companies are doing, how they're responding, even within the the, the during the, the coronavirus pandemic, and what that means, what the implications might be for for other companies who are looking at them and 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 uh, and, and and trying to determine what their next moves will be. So, if we look at uh, if we look at the uh, the next slide here, uh, this is. This just gives you a, a, a general sort of framing for what, what's been happening in uh, among European majors in in the last uh, six to seven months. Uh, there's we've seen that there's been this you know what we call a sort of a race to net zero, where uh, where the European majors have have dramatically expanded their emissions reduction ambitions, uh, and that has set them even further sort of apart from. From the U.S. majors that, that we were talking about before, uh, th this again is a product of uh, investor pressures. Uh, and uh, what is what is important and notable is that co companies are uh, are committing to significant uh, cuts in life cycle emissions. So uh, we're thinking of not just scopes one and two, which are general operational emissions. We're also thinking about scope three, which is which is which includes. Uh, the the actual you know, the sales of the product the, the emissions from the product itself uh, when it's sold uh, so, or combusted and so that is uh, that's th those are significant developments in and of themselves just some of those changes and you can see that we've had Rep Repsol kind of started off in in, in December 2019 being the first oil major to announce net zero goals uh, we've seen successively uh, announcements by Equinor, BP, any Shell and Total all uh, is strengthening their their ambitions and commitments uh, and what's what is uh, what is obvious but but important to emphasize is that that this is happening despite the COVID pandemic uh, and companies are uh, you know are doing this in spite of this and, and some may argue they're doing this actually uh, this is the, the COVID pandemic itself is is only further uh, incentivizing companies to to, uh, to to take these types of actions because this is what uh, investors believe will will ensure longer term resilience of their business models um, and uh, and I the the other point that I think is deserves uh, emphasis is that 
yes, it, yes, these targets are 30 years out, but what's what's actually what we're we're actually seeing you know tangible actions in the near term as a result of this type of uh, strategic reorientation that we'll talk about uh, in, in in the next couple of slides. So let me just let me just add a, a little bit more detail on. Um, the uh, the emissions reduction targets uh, the, themselves. So the, the, there's it, it is uh, there are two things that are important to emphasize here. One is that the, the the ambitions are quite clear from this from this this graphic. Now this is an illustrative graphic where you know comparing every com company based on sort of a 20, 2015, and, uh, but it's it's still helpful to see the the this the significance and the magnitude. Of the the emissions reduction targets that these companies are, are pursuing, you know they are looking at you know as much as sixty five percent reduction in in uh, in emissions intensity uh, in in the case of Shell, and uh, this is uh, this is you know we're looking at uh, also net net zero uh, in 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 many cases uh, uh, that that uh, it includes reduction of emissions plus uh, plus uh, any uh, uh, negative emissions uh, technologies to help offset the remaining the remaining emissions, uh, and this is you know this is uh, all, all are basically setting life life cycle um, intensity targets of, of at least fifty percent. Um, it is the, the other the other point though is that these targets are quite complex. Uh, that these this it's it's not easy to actually compare these different these different targets. They are. Uh, dependent on the specific cases of individual companies. So, for example, you know, BP has 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 set set a, a goal focused on uh, emissions reduction goal, uh, uh, a net zero goal focused on its uh, its its own production, but not 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 necessarily third party sales. Uh, we see that it, it there are um, there are net zero ambitions in the case of Shell, but that. That, it, that in order to get all the way to net zero, it will need to work closely with third parties to, to help them uh, to, to, to carry out the sort of remaining 35% of the emissions uh, intensity reductions. Uh, and in another case, for example, Total has set net zero uh, goals, but only for European operations. So it just shows that, that there are uh, you know, specific uh, you know, cases uh, for, in, in, for each company. Uh, that have to be taken into consideration, but that shouldn't. I, we shouldn't dwell. I think, in some ways, on on the the finer details. The the ambitions are quite quite clear and and quite significant. Um, so then, uh, this just a uh, just to, to to round out the presentation. Um, th this is you know again, like I was saying before, this the these targets are. Uh, uh, Indicative of a broader set of actions, um, uh, priorities that uh, you know that provide sort of uh, that provide sort of clear indication of, of of the trajectory of these of these companies uh, over the over the longer term. Uh, they they've uh, there's we can kind of see that the energy the the energy transition implementation strategies among these companies is having sort of three different phases uh, or, or 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 different sort of uh, stages, um, which are in some ways occurring in somewhat in parallel, but also there's a there's a progression as well. Uh, so the first is kind of laying the foundation. So that includes you know strengthening financial resilience. An example like Shell cutting its dividend may may speak to this type of of, of uh, effort to bolster financial resilience. Uh, companies uh, in general, as you saw in the index, generally perform. Uh, 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 pretty well on, on financial resilience, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, there's there's also the aspect of fundamental reorganization, and I'm going to talk about that on the next slide in more detail. But this is companies really re redesigning and rethinking themselves uh, to uh, to uh, to all the way down to the through the organizational structure. And then there's this sort of a second stage or phase, and this is an acceleration of investments. We're beginning to see this acceleration of investments, especially in the power sector. Uh, a good example may be the the effort, the moves into offshore wind, with with several companies really uh, driving that forward, uh, including, you know, for example, Equinor, which is it's which is focused largely on that aspect. Uh, so that that is an area. This is these tend to be more proven technologies. 
uh, and, and give companies the opportunity the, the, to, to scale up quickly. Uh, there are also, there's also, we expect uh, going to be acceleration in focus on technologies that may, uh, that may not be as proven. So that would include carbon capture and storage, uh, as well as hydrogen. There's been a lot of discussion uh, uh, just recently about hydrogen. We do see this as, as likely uh, to be a, a, a key factor uh, in, in companies' uh, priorities as, as they think through the, the, this, the, you know, the, the viability of hydrogen uh, in, in, the, in the medium term. Um, and then there's, there's a third phase uh, that uh, we're, where you know, we, we could see companies really doing some things that would previously be unthinkable. Uh, so that would be uh, dramatically uh, scaling back oil and gas operations, uh, including you know, it, you know, the you know, critical, what, what we would see as sort of critical assets that companies currently hold. And, 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 and in fact, you know, if we do follow the logic of these, uh, of these emissions reduction targets, in some ways, th this is going to be sort of quite significant. So if you, if, you, uh, you know, if you look at sort of some of Total's announcements, Total's sort of the, 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 the company that has officially uh, made some statements about the, the radical portfolio implications of its, of its emissions reduction targets. And we see you know, oil, uh, oil as a contribution of total sales, uh, or liquids as a contribution of total sales uh, falling uh, to 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 twenty percent, and and uh, fif only fifteen of uh, percent of 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 of, of which is is uh, or or uh, seventy five percent of the twenty percent is uh, is is in uh, is oil uh, is petroleum. Uh, so it just shows how dramatically uh, these companies will need to shift uh, from you know in the case of Total maybe around fifty five percent oil. Uh, sales currently, uh, so that just shows uh, how significant uh, this this is going to be for for uh, companies' uh, portfolios, and this you know those are the types of considerations that will be sort of in that transformational phase. The other aspect of that will be you know considerations of of buying maybe buying into making more transformational transformational uh, um, acquisitions, uh, for example, in the power sector. You know, if a company like Shell wants to be sort of the largest uh, electricity provider, uh, you know, in, in the coming decades, uh, that, that may merit, uh, you know, consideration of purchase of, of trying to buy some of those assets uh, or buy up a utility, for example. So they're, they're, the, the implications are quite significant. And to, to, to this point, we are seeing companies really taking steps to, to advance uh, those. One example of that, uh, is is it in the corporate reorganization and, and restructuring, and so we've seen quite a significant amount of activity on this front as well. Just in the last, uh, really in in the, in the last um, um, couple of months as well, actually. Uh, so you know we we do have there there are d different kind of emerging models in terms of the the overall corporate uh, structures that that companies are pursuing, and, and companies are still thinking about this as well. Uh, so, you know, we do have certain cases like Equinor where there's a, uh, which is, has a more upstream weighted business model and retains sort of new energy as a freestanding unit. We also have cases like Total and Shell, uh, which uh, have both merged their new energy and renewables into core integrated gas units. Uh, in the case of BP, uh, we, we've, it's, it's, BP has announced the sweeping uh, reorganization and sees low low carbon activities combined with gas. Um, it's also uh, aims to merge its upstream and downstream oil. And, uh, and then we also have cases like uh, Repsol and Eni where they're, you know, Repsol's combining new energy and its retail operations. And Eni is taking a similar approach, um, but, but sort of part of a, <laughs> part of a, a more ambitious uh, reorganization splitting the company into two main divisions. So, uh, you know, this is, this is just uh, an, a good indicator, I think, of, of how companies are, you know, seriously thinking about uh, the, you know, how they position themselves for, for the, the, this, the transition. Uh, and we, we should, we, we will, we, we should see, you know, we, we do also know that Shell, for example, is, is, has been, uh, is, is uh, conducting an, an extensive internal review uh, around its, its current organization. So that could, you know, it, that, that could also be something to keep, a, keep an eye out for uh, in, in the fall. 
Um, <clears throat> this, you know, I think these, it's just important to reiterate that by, by carrying out these types of plans, this, this is another example of, you know, potentially setting the stage for an acceleration, a further acceleration of activity uh, in, in, the, in, the coming, in the coming years. So something to keep an eye out for. Um, so finally, um, I, I just like to kind of come back to the vulnerability index and, you know, with, with a little bit of exploration of the, you know, of the corporate strategy in Europe, kind of bring it back to sort of the, the, the peer groups that we started with and, uh, and emphasize you know, what, what should come next for companies? Um, what, what are the main focus or priority action areas that, that companies should be focused on? And, and I, I want to, you know, I, I want to mention that, you know, the, the aim of our vulnerability index is to, to give clients, uh, uh, provide sort of a constructive tool for, uh, for understanding how they're positioned and also where areas where they can uh, improve in the future where they're strong and also where they can improve. And so, uh, you know, part of this, is, you know, you can see here, these are just some recommendations for where companies should be prioritizing uh, their, their focus in the, in the nearer term. Uh, and and it, it will vary based on the comp each company's starting point. So for example, uh, in the case of independent EMPs, the focus is, is, is more on the sort of the orange, the, the orange uh, rows. Uh, which are sort of on the resilient side, portfolio resilient side. Here, uh, just improving, uh, focusing on uh, you know the, the value over volumes. Uh, in other words, you know, efficient capital efficiency of operation, project execution, et cetera, remain quite important. Uh, there is growing, uh, I think, uh, emphasis and pressure on carbon efficiency, which is another uh, another factor. And and then finally, building out, laying out a, a, a clearer and more robust uh, transition strategy. What, what is the vision for these companies uh, in, in the medium to longer term? Uh, on the other hand, we have European majors uh, that, are, uh, that are certainly, uh, you know, out ahead of, 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 of others, but, but still there are, uh, there are some critical issues that, that, that uh, you know, priority action areas that we identify, uh, you know, that includes, um, you know, again, balancing out those, the, the, the financial challenges uh, or financial uh, pressures and priorities for be, between the near term and the longer term. Uh, it, it includes, you know, continuing to improve on carbon efficiency, uh, and, and also just shoring up the the, the operations even on the hydrocarbon uh, the, in, in terms of the hydrocarbon sector value chain, and 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 advancing low carbon investment. Uh, in the middle, we have U.S. super majors. Here again, there's kind of a balance between uh, resilience uh, priorities as well as building out. Uh, a robust transition strategy. Uh, and, and then finally, uh, national oil companies, uh, again, even if they are resilient, uh, emphasis is on laying out the, those, those, the, the transition strategies. What, is, uh, what, we, what I'd emphasize even for the at-risk NOCs is that while, they, you know, while maybe they have not been performing uh, so well on the vulnerability index as generally integrated companies, uh, that that can can have a lot of can in some cases have su strong support from the state. They they may have certain flexibility uh, that 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 uh, you know that others may not enjoy, and so that that uh, that can be an advantage for them. So I think with that um, I, I will uh, I, I will stop uh, and and take questions for the next uh, for the next uh, you know for the remaining sort of uh, 10, 10 minutes or so. Um, so let me just see if I can uh, kind of look through some of these questions as, as I talk. Um, so yes, okay, so good question. I see here uh, a question on uh, looking at different types of companies uh, and you know, whether or not uh, you know, other companies in other segments of the value chain are, are, are more or less vulnerable. That's a really good question. Um, so what we tried to do was, was emphasize in this initial take uh, sort of the, the, the key in, uh, integrated companies, mainly integrated companies with, with, uh, with also sort of an uh, emphasis toward some of the, the key upstream uh, independents. And so, uh, so it's true that we, we have not looked at sort of independent refiners, for example, and, uh, and there, are, there are plenty of questions around that. I think that there are, there are probably methodological questions that, we, that, that, uh, that, that also play a role in the sense that you know, when we're, we, we, it's, it's, it's not as easy to compare, uh, you know, um, uh, an independent refiner with a, with a integrated company. 
Uh, and uh, so that, that's one factor. Um, in, in terms of uh, whether or not these are, are more or less vulnerable to transition risks, I think, um, you know, it depends. Uh, it, I think one of, the key, one of the key operating assumptions that we have in, in the index is that, uh, that, that we do see, for example, gas demand continuing to grow more rapidly than oil demand. Uh, so that that's something that uh, that has has an impact uh, in you know potentially thinking about uh, downstream. We do see though that petrochemicals remains uh, is is likely to remain a, 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 a durable a more durable demand segment as well. So uh, so that can play a role. Those are some things to to think about. Um, so um, let's see if I can answer a couple of more questions. I, I hope that was helpful. What, one thing I, I guess the final thing I will say on that. Is that we we are you know aiming to kind of expand and broaden this and uh, this index and so we will try to include more companies as time goes on. We also do analyze companies in in other ways too through through different types of analysis. So uh, so we we can we can certainly consider uh, you know adding coverage uh, for example on and, and other segments of the value chain that that we we cover. Um, let's see if I can see some more. Um, um, ah, okay. So why, why do you think there, uh, why, why do you think that there is a, uh, that there will be more pressure on us make super majors to, to, to make, uh, to make the transition? Um, so <clears throat> that's a good question too. I, I think that I, I'm, I'm thinking about it more from a, from a relative standpoint. Um, I, I we, when we look at, uh, the, the evolution of, uh, of, of in, investor pressures, uh, the, the investor pressures are are growing uh, across uh, across the industry, and we're seeing that uh, that you know that they're rising uh, in 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 the U.S. In particular, we see some big you know some big you know, the big developments like the, some of the more conservative asset managers now being sort of more more proactive in this area uh, as as an example of that. Um, we I, I would say that uh, you know this is this is relative to sort of the, the what we've seen among U.S. super majors in the in the last several years. So we expect that those pressures will continue to rise. And we do see, for example, if you look at some of the, some of the recent, uh, the recent Black Rock report, for example, you do see that, you know, uh, super majors have been highlighted. There's, there's, uh, there is some, you know, there's definitely an engagement um, process that's, that's going on. So we just expect that there will be greater scrutiny around these issues moving forward. And, and that, uh, and that, that, uh, Therefore, the, these these companies will 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 have uh, will 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 feel more pressure to uh, to uh, to not necessarily uh, not necessarily pursue a transformational strategy like a European major, but rather to to just lay out uh, it, it, what what is their vision it, it for an adaptation strategy? How what are, what are the key areas uh, that they're prioritizing uh, to to strengthen uh, their 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 resilience moving forward? Uh, and and ground those in sort of in targets and uh, that that we've seen uh, fr from other companies as well. So I think that's uh, that that's kind of what I was what, what I what I meant in that sense. Um, let's see, um, let's see that it, it is uh, that the ESG adaptation away from hydrocarbons is 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 by definition a good thing. Okay, so. A couple of things here. So I, I think that ESG. I, I don't think that we we see that, for example, in vulnerability, that moving away from from hydrocarbons is necessarily a good thing. Uh, I think that we 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 try to be sort of agnostic on that front. We we see that you know adaptation strategies, building the the, the you know building up the, the resilience is, is quite important uh, as well. And and so it's it's not that it's not that uh, that uh, you know that that. Uh, Adaptation away from hydrocarbons is, is is by definition a good thing. We do expect, though, that there will be that that challenges to demand uh, will will there will be challenges to, to certain uh, aspects of, of the hydrocarbon sector value chain in terms of uh, you know the outlook for for dip oil demand, for example. Uh, there's uh, there are, there are factors such as that 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 may limit sort of the the the, the potential there. We also see that that it's it, it's uh, it's decarbonization is is a critical priority so the question is how do you how do companies decarbonize their portfolios and there are different ways to do that so one could could pursue a decarbonization approach that's primarily uh, you know through through negative emissions uh, and, and uh, you know moving away, maybe moving um, at least moving more toward gas for example 
that, that there are some big challenges with respect to sort of uh, large scale CCS. And so that's, a, that's an issue there. Uh, and, and so it, it's not but, you know, necessarily a good or bad thing. We're trying to be predictive about you know, what, the, what the outlook is for certain segments of, of demand. I, I, hope, I hope that, uh, that makes sense. Um, and um, let's see here, if I can, we'll, 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 let's see if I have some good um, questions here. There are a lot, thank you for all of your questions. Um, uh, yes, um, okay. Um, can an oil and gas company um, can an oil and gas company make money during the process of the energy transition? Okay, that's a good question. Um, maybe I can kind of uh, finish up with this one. Um, so I think that that's that's a really good question that we've been talking about with clients, and there there is question. You know, let let's let's consider a, a situation like uh, like the the European uh, like the European majors that I've been talking about before. There's a lot of questions about sort of the profitability of of moving more and more into renewables, uh, and and how that stacks up against the profitability of uh, of you know more, more more traditional oil and gas sector operations, uh, you know in in the sense that oil and gas sector is generally you know generated you know double digit quite strong you know even you know twenty percent more plus returns uh, in, for projects, whereas uh, renewables returns are are are, are you know lower. Uh, and uh, and so that's that's a that's definitely sort of a, a, a consideration. I think that there are a couple of issues there. Uh, there's one is there's you know the question of the volatility uh, of those projects and whether or not we you know, there are stranded asset risks for some of those that could dramatically affect the the returns. There's uh, there's also questions about sort of what type of model uh, companies will pursue in in renewables. Uh, so. And what types of synergies can be generated across a range of different solutions? Uh, so that's that's an issue. Uh, you know, in, for example, a developer model. If if a company is pursuing a more develop a developer focused model, uh, they they could you know conceivably generate higher returns, not to, not the six to eight percent IRRs that we we see. Also, the cost of capital uh, is 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 uh, quite low as well. So you know, I think there's we're still in early stages of, of really seeing how these companies. Uh, these de de develop their business models uh, and the niches that they that they each uh, try to pursue. Uh, but you know, I think that there's uh, you know there there are there are potential reasons for uh, wanting to continue to move into you know into other areas like that and, and generate returns. Um, and and also you know that so that's I think that's sort of the main those would be sort of the main issues that I would or uh, that I would uh, focus on as we're thinking about that. So. Um, maybe I'll leave it there. I think we're we're getting close to the to the to the end of the hour, and um, and uh, th I just wanted to thank everyone for for your questions. I'm sorry I didn't answer uh, all of them, but um, but please don't hesitate to follow up, and uh, be happy to um, you know to to try to uh, to do my best to answer those. So thanks again. I I, I really appreciate the time and the attention. Oh my, thank you very much, TJ. Uh, USAE wishes to thank uh, TJ Conway for an outstanding webinar. Uh, this webinar uh, is going to be available on USAE's website on our Rewind page. Uh, please tell your friends and colleagues to, uh, uh, to check it out. It is an open access format for uh, anyone to view. A reminder, if you're not a member of the association, we welcome you to join by visiting us at www.usaee.org. I thank you for attending, wish you all a wonderful weekend, and I officially close this webinar.